Good evening, and welcome to Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, a series of conversations with startup founders and their investors on what it takes to build a viable, fundable startup. I'm Chris Gill, President and CEO of SVAs, the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs, the largest and fastest growing nonprofit in Northern California, dedicated to helping entrepreneurs across all technologies build successful companies. This week, I'll be interviewing Jody Pasquale of College Wikis and the lead investor in their first round of funding, Roy Sardinia of High Bar Ventures. So Joe and Roy, good to see you. Welcome to Silicon Valley Entrepreneur. Thanks for having us. Joe, let me start with you. What were you doing before you founded College Wikis? Uh, well, before I, f I actually founded College Wikis when I was in business school, um, I had been doing strategy consulting for four years and then uh, decided to go to business school. I went out to Stanford for business school because I knew that I wanted to do something entrepreneurial and specifically in the internet. Um, I had always, um, even when I was in college, I had worked for, for example, like MTV Networks in their online business development department and also been a campus rep for another kind of startup job site online. So I came out to Stanford uh, and knew that I wanted to start something and through those two years um, decided on the College Wiki's idea. And how did that come about? Well, the original idea, actually, it's funny, it, it's funny that you asked it because the idea was actually a direct offshoot of my experience in the business school. Right. Um, so uh, as a student there, I you have these email lists. Like for example, we had one for the second year class, um, MBA class. And there's literally like 20 to 30 emails per day that get sent out over that list. Anything from like, you know, uh, what about this course? My friend got waitlisted. Uh, what, what, you know, what, what could I tell her? Um, you know, uh, where to get a haircut, what about this restaurant, um, really anything and everything. And there was also a culture of answering those questions. But there was never any, um, any, anything that captured any of those answers. So everyone who answered the questions, those answers would essentially die in the person's email box who received them. Um, and I thought, why not? I knew um, kind of how much students knew and loved Wikipedia as um, just a great kind of content management system that they use and almost, for better or worse, can't write a paper without. So I thought, why not kind of merge the, um, the affiliation and the affinity that someone has for their college with the goodwill that they feel towards the wiki interface? Right. Um, and that was the genesis of the idea behind college wikis. Um, uh, it was just kind of that, uh, that uh, mashup between you know, um, people asking and answering each other's questions and using a very popular uh, content management interface. And um, I mean, I feel really fortunate to have been in that kind of environment because while I was there, for example, I had a class where Terry Semmel, who was the CEO of Yahoo, spoke. Um, and he spoke about how Yahoo Answers um, is and was one of the quickest growing divisions within Yahoo. Um, and since then, we've seen a definite answers trend online. So, for example, LinkedIn now does answers. Or you'll see um, Amazon, they have an answers product called Askville. eBay has answers. And so actually what we did with College Wikis was we said we knew that um, wikis in and of themselves weren't viral. So they weren't, wouldn't kind of have that viral snowball effect. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we said, you know, we know that Answers is amazing for content generation. Um, we know that people like the wiki interface. And we also know that email, you know, ever since the days of Hotmail, has been um, something that has just spread like wildfire really quickly. So we actually took, um, you know, the, the wiki interface and an answer's ability, which you don't have on Wikipedia, but mm -hmm. which you do have on college wikis. So asking a question and getting answers. Uh, and even the ability to ask those questions out to email, to groups of email, like for example, um, your, your dorm email list, or your class year, or your courses, or your major, or anything you want really. Um, we, we allow you to ask those questions to those people, and that's given us a lot of traction since we launched last April. Okay. I'll come back to you mm -hmm. and dig some deeper in that, but I want to sure. bring Roy into this. Mm -hmm. You were an early employee at Sun yep. uh, when you were pretty young. Sales. Yep. And so how, how did you get into being a venture capitalist? Um, I left Sun um, after a, a, a fun 11-year career there. I, my last job was I was responsible for corporate development for the company, so essentially investing the company's money in companies to buy, so startups and looking mm -hmm. like we, we did um, a security company that 
you know, worked with Checkpoint when Checkpoint did the thing with us. We did um, Java was part of a startup organization. It was actually a set top box business, and um, I was put in charge of that when we decided to make it a software program. So it, it, I had a very entrepreneurial job in Sun, and that the great thing about a place like that was every two years you had a new job because the place evolves kind of quickly. You know, you go from right. 400 employees to I don't know 45,000 or something in my career there, 36,000 I think when I left. So you have a, a fairly rapid growth rate. And I left Sun to, to go start a company called Brocade Communications, which was in the um, fiber channel storage business. An ex-Sun mm -hmm. employee, a couple of people that I knew at Sun who were the venture guys on that deal. And there have been a large number of Sun venture, people in the venture capital business that had come from Sun. Um, at Kleiner Perkins, who was the guys who funded Sun, and a couple more, more David Allen, all over the valley. There's a mm -hmm. lot of venture guys. So when we went to do Brocade, we needed funding, and Andy Bechtelsheim, Andy Bechtelsheim and Bill Joy helped us fund Brocade, and we did that via vehicle um, that became High Bar Ventures, which is the venture company that we started. So while we were doing that deal, we saw another deal, and we all wrote a check, and then we saw another deal, and, we all, and pretty soon you're writing checks, and you're going, you know, somebody should organize this <laughs> um, so that the tax man doesn't get to us. So you end up starting a venture company either because you join a very established venture company, or in our case, it is a captive venture company for three guys, uh, Bill, okay. Bill, Andy, and myself. Okay, and, and that was formed when? Or mid 90s, late 90, mid to late 90s, yeah, we, we do, um, brocade. I left Sun in 95 to do Brocade. Brocade was founded in 95, mm -hmm. so 95, 96 kind of time frame is when we started doing the investments. Right, so we something did, The first investment in Brocade was actually in the spring of 96. They had taken a seed investment from um, Crosspoint Ventures, from Seth Nyman, who had been at Sun, and from Rich Chaparro, who had been at a division of Sun. So they were the two venture guys that started um, Brocade. So in the spring is when we brought in our outside round. Um, LSI Semiconductor was an investor in that. Uh, Rocky Pimentel, who whose wife, Lori, had been at Sun, um, mm. was the CFO over at LSI Logic. Um, Andy, Bill, mostly insider guys. John Fiber, who was the investor that we brought in from more David Al Ventures, was VP of Software at Sun. Like I said, it's a small valley. Okay, <laughs> so we'll, we'll definitely come back to some of that, but again, back to you, Joe, if I may. Sure. So, you saw the need for something right. uh, like College Wikis when you were at Stanford. Right. So you were doing an MBA. Did you finish your, your M MBA course? Or I did finish it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what did you do from that? Did you go directly into College Wikis or what, sure. what, what happened? Um, well, you know, I, I founded the company in April of my second year in business school. The idea kind of started gelling actually in December of 2005. Um, Throughout the beginning parts, I was looking for the team. So I ended up linking up with two other Stanford computer science guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we incorporated in April of 2006. Um, I hired them full-time over that summer of 2006 uh, and raised some kind of friends and family capital um, by August of 2006. And then uh, it took us until April of 2007 to launch. So I think you know one thing is that, I mean, as you know, startups take a while. Um, to implement, you know, kind of the concept is one thing and implementation is another thing. So between getting the team, uh, doing the development to actually be able to launch a, a site uh, and all of that, uh, it took us, I would say, about a year after incorporation to actually launch. So. Okay, so instead of going out for you know, a highly paid job with your MBA to pay off right. the hundred thousand sure. dollars that you now owe on that sure <laughs> you, you, you then went in to do a startup right what did your friends and family think of uh, this? well it's uh, I never asked <laughs> and I guess something I one thing I would say but it is funny um I mean um, it definitely was close to the people who are going into those career paths so actually the summer in business school I did investment banking um, right. at the tech group in Deutsche Bank so but mostly because I wanted to see, um, you know, I got to see kind of how exits were orchestrated and the actual kind of financing of companies, which was really interesting. Um, and you know, my best friend from college actually works for a hedge fund, so I definitely know kind of that other that other walk of life. Mm -hmm. For me, um, uh, I guess I didn't I didn't really I never questioned it because I believed so strongly um, uh, in not only uh, in the idea itself. But I knew for for my personality and kind of how hard I wanted to work after school, I knew that uh, it wouldn't make sense for me to work for someone else. Basically, okay. um, I knew that whatever I would do, I would make sure that it was successful. So it, um, why not start your own business? So found the found the the opportunity, came up with the idea of how to fulfill it. Sure. Decided to go 
straight for it, make it happen. Sure. No startup goes smoothly. So what, sure. what was the biggest challenge that you've hit so far and how um, did you get, gosh, get through it? Well, like, honestly, I kind of think what wasn't the biggest challenge? Um, everything's a big challenge. Uh, so from finding the team, I remember, for example, um, kind of going out to business school classmates to get MB other MBA students on the team. This was before I realized that um, MBA people don't add, like add a lot of value. Actually, like myself, <laughs> unfortunately, we need programmers. So um, no other MBA students were interested in as interested as I was in mm -hmm. founding something. So that was an interesting experience for me. And so I went to the computer science department. It was very fortunate, um, and again, it's just fortunate because Stanford has that resource um, to be able to uh, link up with people who could actually implement, who could actually get things done. Um, so I definitely think. Finding uh, the team is one challenge. Even just now, I mean, you know, so we're a year and a month old now in terms of, you know, having been launched a year, in a year and a month ago. We just brought on um, a director of engineering whom I'm really excited about. Uh, he led the development of thestreet.com mm -hmm. uh, and also led the development of eMusic. He was lead developer there and lead developer as well as at Cafe Mom Industries. So um, uh, we're s building teams ongoing and I guess it never ends is one thing I would say. Um, I was also, it was, uh, fundraising was also kind of a first uh, time experience for me. So um, it was interesting to me to uh, kind of do discussions with people from uh, kind of and the angel and the venture side, learn about both how those things are structured and learn about kind of what those people are looking for. So that was a very, I think, an interesting kind of, you know, kind of few months for me. Okay. So, Roy, back to you, if I may. How did you get to to meet Joe, and what attracted you to him and the concept in the first place? So there's a <coughs> SFA's. Your organization runs a bi-monthly, um, I guess they call it a competition. I don't see it as a competition, but a, a bi-monthly forum yep. at which six companies present to a number of entrepreneurs, and I've done most of them because um, I enjoy. You know, I've started four or five companies, so I love hearing the pitch. I mean, the pitch is the pitch, right? And you you give them six or eight minutes to do this pitch. And Joe was one of the presenters last July, and in fact, didn't win that night. Yeah. I voted him the highest number of points. Some origami folding software metal, sheet metal thing won right. that night. I don't know if you remember that, but yep. their gimme, gimmick was they gave us a piece of metal that folded into a card holder that we all took home. Right. <laughs> but it was a mathematical equation to fold like washing machines. I, it was uh, unbelievable that it won. Right. I picked Joe to be the winner and was shocked when he didn't. And after I, I introduced myself, I said, you know, that's a great idea. I really liked his enthusiasm, wicked smart, and you just knew it. You just, you know, we invest in smart people. I love smart people. And so, you know, he called me to ask me a couple of questions about fundraising sure. in general. I said, sure. you know what? I'll tell you what, I'll introduce you to a couple of my a couple of people that I know. Right. You should talk you should talk to these kinds of guys because they're the kinds of people who will write checks in this in this space. And we went to a couple of big large right. VC firms, right? yeah. some of the largest VC firms, sure. and showed them what I thought was a tremendous idea. And every time I saw Joe do it, the numbers got better. We actually demoed it once to a, a fairly famous room full of VCs. They asked a question just to test him, and he logged in as if he was a student at the University of Georgia, and he's turning around to do the rest of the pitch, and the answers are popping up behind him as he's speaking. And it was like, where do you get the best hamburger? And while he's standing there, yeah. students in Georgia are answering that <laughs> yeah, question. Right. Like, you sure. moron, of course you go here. Yeah. You know I mean? So, right. I, I mean, you just could see the virality of the whole pro mm -hmm. project. And um, we typically don't do internet deals at High Bar, mm -hmm. but I liked it, and I liked Joe a lot. So eventually, after being turned down by a couple of pretty large VC firms that I thought had made a huge mistake. I said, you know, Andy, we're going to write a check here. And Highbar wrote the check. Highbar wrote the term sheet, which got in his funding. But um, I think mm -hmm. the world of, of Joe and his, I mean, he's, you know, we were talking about a little bit on the way over. Uh, you, we were talking about it here while we were waiting for the show to begin. But I mean, he, he flies back and forth across the coast and I never know what time zone he's on, but I know that if I'm on California time, I can always call him and he answers. And I have some really bizarre hours. And I'm like, if he answers in those times, that means he's getting even less sleep than me. Because he might even be on the West East Coast on the day I call him. So he's a very hardworking, right. very smart, has hired really, really bright people. Sure. And and so we hire teams, right? We, we, we invest in teams. I like Joe. I like the idea. I like the team that was doing it. Mm -hmm. And we put together a great consortium of, of co-investors, actually. Sure. Well, let me just come back to you on, the, on that point about team, because the, sort of the, the, the general thinking in the Valley is you have to have a founding team. 
with two, three members on that team, you know, and there's a certain look and feel to it. But Joe kind of was on his own and employed to other people. What, what's, right. what's your view yeah, on But that? I think that in some of these circumstances, this is a little different because the technology to do it, while very interesting, was not the deepest part of this. The, the idea, the concept was the hard part here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying programming is easy because God knows that the QA people, I, I have an engineering degree and QA, I promised QA I'd never write code again. That's my promise to the world, I'll never do software. But the idea was the most difficult part. Implementing the idea and on a, on a, on a BD, ba a business development basis, on a project management basis, Joe's handled all that. And he's had some outstanding software developers who came with him 15 sure. months ago or 18 months ago now right. that are still there. So I think that, um, well, I consider Joe the founder because he's been the face person. He's got some developers that have been with him a very long time, but it's not like some of the high tech projects where you know you got to have an interface engineer. And, mm -hmm. You know, this is a much simpler um, idea, and having a single founder for me is not a problem. And Joe acts like the single founder. He's raised all the money, he does all the idea. You know, he's one hard working dude. Okay. Thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you you were very fortunate to. Mm -hmm. To meet Roy at, a, at an SFA's first impressions program, which, which, which is it's de de designed to give uh, first-time entrepreneurs the opportunity to stand up in front of real life right. investors and get a mm -hmm. feel for it. Did you have? Had you developed a, a funding strategy on how you were going to meet p potential investors prior to that? Or um, was it? I d I didn't. Uh, I would say no. I didn't have a, a real strategy. I kind of was reaching out to people. Um, whom I knew or friends or you know, people whom I knew had either invested in classmate startups or through events like yours. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, you know, it ended up being a successful strategy just to kind of, t uh, because I was still learning about the process, just to do as many conversations as possible uh, and talk to kind of anyone who would hear me talk uh, and just learn from them kind of you know uh, who the best people to hit to kind of talk to about this business would be because everyone has something that they're looking for whether it's the size of the investment whether it's the industry that the investment is in or the specific technology whether they're looking you know have the most focus on the team or the traction or uh, the size of the market uh, everyone is different as an investor and I think um, what happened with this is that um, I was fortunate to meet um, both Roy from High Bar mm -hmm. and also some other investors who, um, you know, uh, participated in this round. Um, uh, a company called Richmond Management, which did Jackster's Series A and Series B out of New York. Um, some angel groups, both here in the Valley, like Silicon Ventures, uh, and also the Harvard Angels Group, and even on the East Coast, Boston Harbor Angels also invested. So I think we were fortunate that there was. Um, interest from a lot of pe enough people to actually put together a pretty sizable round um, and now everyone all of those entities were looking for something different yep. um, but you know uh, th but also kind of really kicked the tires and um, knew the company well before investing so okay now again back, back to you Roy because this is something that ca came up at a recent uh, um, event we ran with Jeffrey Moore where he explained crossing the chasm 2.0 in you know, he knew how to do it and describe for business to business, but business to consumer was a whole different deal. And when, when you see a, a, a deal like this that is involving, uh, um, it's more about the p number of people who are coming to it than anything else at this stage, how do you decide between the factors of the team, the potential of the market, the number of people that are coming to visit the website? What are the metrics or, or, or the gut feels that so make you decide? I, I think some of the thing? metrics are different depending on the deal. We've rec I did recently did another deal that is measuring the number of people but in a different way. In College Wiki's case, they register. Right. So it's the number of users that hit the website. In addition, to that, it's the number of registered users. Cause okay. And it's a demographic. I mean, college-educated students, I can't imagine people who spend more money than these guys. I mean, I guess there are. I, I'm not a demographic <laughs> specialist, but it's a highly sought-after demographic. And you capture them, and we're already seeing, and we've mm -hmm. started to see that they don't leave, right? right? I mean, we, we invested it in another company that does mail systems, and um, colleges, every time they have a freshman class show up with 10,000 students, have to add about 7,000 mailboxes, because most of the people don't give up their mailbox on the day they leave. So if you're the university, you want to keep your alumni there. You have a Stanford alumni sure. account, right? Of yeah. course you do. Uh -huh. I have a, a Wisconsin alumni account. I know why you an alumni account, right? right? And so 
they're highly sought after even after they leave college. So they're a very um, sticky, as they say, mm -hmm. kind of user. And as a registered user, they're even more valuable. You just know lots about them. So the demographics to sell to them and to um, monetize, and I hate to use that word, but to monetize the asset is very, very high. I mean, this isn't like, you know, watching bad video and you don't have to tell me who you are, you just have to watch the same cat doing back somersaults off a table thing for a year. Mm -hmm. um, these are people who are answering questions that are relevant to each other, has a high degree of stickiness, that's what we like. So when we look at the demographics, for example, sure. we look at the statistics. Um, t tell me again, who's the stickiest page? Facebook, right? How many minutes? Oh gosh, uh, definitely over 50 minutes. Over 50 minutes, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So you're looking wow. for sites where people stay right. more than a minute mm -hmm. and less than 50. Yep. Right, <laughs> um, right, and and so the statistics have gotten better, and we're seeing it in some of the other companies that we invest in. When it's in this space, you, you're looking for how long do they stay? How many times do they visit a month? What's their repeat visit? How long do they have a window open but not stay? Meaning they've left it open, and you add features to do that in all kinds of companies. You're trying right. to get them to be stickier sites so that you can either. So let me ask you on, on this: if 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 you're doing something like this in this in this sort of space, in which lots of people are, it's, it's relatively cheap to get into it. Do you have to have... Not that cheap. A couple of million bucks is what it takes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's not chump change. No, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, is it, is it the number of you, 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 you unique visitors that you get? Is it, is it 10,000? Is it 100,000? Oh, is it a million? Oh, Where you do measure, you know? Sure. Well, you don't, I don't know. You know. Sure. You know? Yeah. I mean, so it depends on... Uh, it really depends on the business. I mean... So a lot of consumer internet startups raise money even before they've launched. So um, there's really no kind of one metric I think that you could, could that you could put say to all companies. Um, for us, uh, because we were doing things, we were you know, we were we raised while we were in what we call beta periods. Right. So of kind of thousands of schools in the U.S., we decided to do a you know a, a stage launch. We're at about 200 of those schools now, uh, and so. Really, um, we weren't making the pitch that our numbers were uh, kind of overwhelming. We get about fifty thousand unique visitors per month, mm -hmm. and, um, but we were saying that these people have a lot of loyalty. They come back to the site multiple times per month. Um, that the demographic, that eighteen to twenty-five year old demographic. I mean, as Roy said, they spend a lot of money in college and. Market studies will tell you that there's only a few times in someone's life when there's basically an open pocketbook, and that's around the birth of a child, you know, your marriage and college, um, mm -hmm. and also um, as an advertising play, it's really ripe for that because um, it is in college when you determine your lifelong purchasing habits. So you know what bank account are you using, what uh, cell phone are you using, you know what. Uh, Apple obviously does a lot of marketing to college students because you're determining you know, what computer you're going to use for the rest of your life as well. So I guess we were trying to, there is no, what I'm saying is there is no one metric. Okay. Um, there are companies that raise, uh, consumer internet companies that raise before they've even, they even have a site. So. But, but I think that the metric that, so we went out there and yeah. when we presented to all these other VCs, because I went with them on a lot of these pitches, sure. the slide in the deck that caught the most interest was some of the percentages of schools of registered users, you know, right. 16 to 20 percent of the students at certain very large universities mm -hmm. are registered users of college wikis. And you go, something's got to be working because sure. students, you know, they don't register. They don't for register for right, right, right. right. Sure. So when 20 percent of a student class registers for right. uh, of a student body registers for something and repeat uses it, and you have tens of thousands of questions at some of these schools, t questions and answers, right. that's sticky. Right. Um, again, it's not cats doing back somersaults yep. off of a table, for God's right. sakes, right? Unfortunately. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's that's right. Yeah, you be, you be working <laughs> for Google right now. Um, that's but, right. but so when we uh, look at the stickiness, that's the thing that appealed to me. It was the loyalty of the, the customer base, how many times they re return. Right. And we knew, I mean, there's still been no monetization. Right. I mean, it's almost mm -hmm. a Craigslist kind of world right now. We just... Mm -hmm. We're, he's spending our hard-earned money, <laughs> sure. um, giving away right. free assets, um, <laughs> and we'll eventually monetize it. And I think that that's the difference. We know the, what the product can do and the target market, and that it's a highly sought-after target market. We just want to do it in a very professional and, and monetize it in the right kind of elegant way. Right. So you don't cheapen it. Okay. Right. We're coming towards the end, so relatively quickly. You, had, you, you say you had uh, money from quite a number of, of different sources. Sure, um, it was a syndicated round. Right, yes. so what was it that attracted you to, to Roy and the High Bar team? 
Because um, they've explained what attracted them that way, what attracted you to these guys? Uh, he really, uh, he understands the business. I'm always impressed when uh, like people will ask him about the business and he, and he, uh, he tells them kind of everything that I would have told them. Uh, he's an entrepreneur uh, by background, so uh, he understands efficiency. Uh, he understands what needs to get done. Um, and I think that's, and there's, you know, if I want to get something done, Roy's someone I will call because, uh, you know, he won't kind of just give me a consultant's answer or just, you know, a venture person's answer, but will say, these are the people I used when I founded this company. Um, this is how I did it when I founded this company, et cetera. So that's been, I think there's just been a lot of value add. And he hasn't, uh, it's been the type of relationship where I want to call him and tell him what's going on rather than, uh, it's because I want his advice, rather than a lot of peers of mine I know who, kind of shy away from calling the venture fund funders and feel, you know, kind of, uh, you know, that they're maybe seeking different things, you know, whereas with Roy, I think we're really aligned to make the business a better business, and he's been extremely helpful with that. So that's why high bar, um, and it's been, it's okay. been a great decision, and I haven't looked back. Okay. So. <laughs> Relatively quickly, we've only got about a minute to go. Um, are there any particular insights that you would have for entrepreneurs? Um, um, I like Guy Kawasaki's big type, few slides. I mean, one of the things that I always, sure. I, the thing I changed from Joe's pitch right away was there's just way too many slides. Yep. There's way too many slides. Sure. Um, if you can't tell your pitch on an elevator truly, um, you're never going to sell it. I, actually, my test, and he, he, I call it the Laura test. My wife's name is Laura. If I can't explain what I'm investing into Laura, they won't get a check. Trust me, they will not get a check. <laughs> um, you know, and my wife was a very early employee at Sun and understands a high-tech business. If I can't explain it to Laura, there's no check coming. So f find a way to boil it down, make it really simple. That I can pitch it to somebody else. If I can't pitch it to either my partners or to another investor to get them to come along, if I have to drag 14 guys, and I've seen pitches where 14 guys come into your conference room because it takes all of them to pitch you on some technical aspect of this, I'm like, wow, yeah. not my deal. <laughs> you know, just... And I like spinning discs and blinking lights as much as anybody else, but I like simple spinning discs and very simple spin blinking lights. Okay. I think um, that you got to just make it simple. Simplify the pitch because if, if your investor can't repitch it to somebody else, you won't get a syndicate. That's we a got a syndicate because I can pitch it to a lot of people. Right. That's a terrific answer. Thank you very sure. much for that. It is time to wrap up the show now, so I'd like to thank Joe and Roy uh, for coming along tonight and sharing their experience with us tonight. So thanks again from Espays and the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, and look out for our next show next month. Thank you. And now yeah, a little bit of carry on.